Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Sandeep Sharma and I welcome you to this rapid revision, focus rapid revision session number 5. Originally this video was supposed to be rheumatology along with neurology but uh, the neurology video I had to split because uh, some of you requested me asking me to add some case scenario related to uh, the musculoskeletal disorders also and some vasculitis also and obviously by adding that the video became too big so because you need to uh, have some time also for revision before the exam so I am putting this rheumatology scenario video as at a separate video at one place right so the usual disclaimer uh, that this session is not a replacement for your existing notes and at least look at it twice uh, the PDF as well as the video uh, twice at least before you sit for the exam and you will have a good revision happening what I am trying to do here is go scenario based and trying to cover most of the MCQs or related topics which have been asked in the recent exams in this paper right so let us start with then mcq here i will be starting with an mcq and then i will be moving to the phenomena so the mcq says there is a 60 year old patient who presented with complaints of he presented with complaints of multiple episodes of digital pallor so you can see that there is pallor happening then they became blue and followed by recovery happening in a few minutes these episodes are often triggered by cold so cold triggers these episodes so pallor cyanosis and recovery since past one week he had severe symptoms and the symptoms did not resolve some of them progressed to gangrene as shown can you see the gangrene which is happening his peripheral blood test is positive for anti-nuclear antibody what is the likely diagnosis i hope you know already that whenever there is exposure to cold stress or vibration there is pallor of the digits followed by cyanosis followed by recovery that is called as Reynolds phenomena. So it is uh, unlikely to be option number A and D. It is either B and C. But whether it is primary Reynolds phenomena or secondary Reynolds phenomena, we need to understand. For those who are thinking, Ki, sir, uh, why not Burgess disease? Burgess disease, also called as thromboangitis obliterans, can also have digital gangrene. But uske andar, this progression will not happen. Ki pale pallor, then cyanosis, then uh, progression to gangrene that progression is not usually seen these patients usually present directly with uh, reduction in the pulsation ischemic changes and gangrene so this progression if it is present that is a Reynolds phenomena without progression gangrene hoga then you will think of Burgess disease in the patient so be careful what is how the question is being framed so obviously we need to first review the topic called as a Reynolds phenomena very important let us do a quick review So before we go further, there is an important phenomena which will make life easier for you that is Reynolds phenomena. Reynolds phenomena is a very very common phenomena. Majority of Reynolds phenomena are benign, we call them as primary Reynolds. Uh, it can be seen in general population according to Harrison. There is also a secondary phenomenon. So first of all, let us understand ki hota kya hai. So whenever there is a patient who is having Reynolds phenomena, there will be whenever there will be exposure to cold or stress or vibration, there will be change in the vasomotor tone and episodic pallor will happen of the digits or tips. So, when it's cold, hoga, stress hoga, or vibration, so the peripheries, hai, that is your finger, sometimes the uh, nasal tip also, sometimes the pinna tip also, there will be episodic pallor. Pallor means paleness. And this pallor will occur because of vasoconstriction of the peripheral blood vessels. So, episodic vasoconstriction hogi whenever these precipitating factors will be there. After a few minutes, it will progress to produce cyanosis of the affected digits. So, there will be cyanosis. This cyanosis will occur because of ischemia of the peripheries. And as soon as cyanosis happens, body's compensatory mechanisms will come into play and there will be spontaneous recovery or hyperemia. What is the meaning of hyperemia? The pink color of the digits will come back. So kya hoga? Normally, our uh, fingers are pink. Uh, on exposure to cold, stress or vibration, first of all, they will become pale. Then they will become blue. Then they will recover and they will become pink again. This phenomena is called as Reynolds phenomena. And this hyperemia and recovery can occur either spontaneously or if it has been exposed, it, if there has been a cold exposure, it can occur on rewarming also. So it can be hastened, it can be fastened up by rewarming the affected digits this phenomena is called as Reynolds phenomena and hyperemia or recovery uh, represents a reperfusion of the affected digits 
So this is what you call as Reynolds phenomena. So obviously, this Reynolds phenomena is of two types. We have the primary Reynolds phenomena and we have the secondary Reynolds phenomena. Primary is also called as Reynolds disease. So whenever they use the word Reynolds disease, disease ka matlab hai, primary is being talked about. And secondary Reynolds phenomena is called a secondary Reynolds phenomena. There is an underlying cause. Which is more common? One primary Reynolds phenomena is the most common variety. Primary Reynolds phenomena, what are the key points you would remember? There is no association. There is no association with any underlying connective tissue disorder or drugs. So it is a very common entity. There is often a positive family history in the patient. So there will be a history that father or mother also have Reynolds phenomena and patient also has Reynolds phenomena. And there will be, uh, it will be episodic and less severe in nature. So it will be a less severe form. There will be no ANA positivity. So anti-nuclear antibody uh, will be absent in these patients. And most important thing, I'm writing with capital words, primary Reynolds phenomena never, never progresses it never progresses to ulcer or gangrene. So if Raynaud's phenomena produces ulcer or gangrene, it can never be a primary Raynaud's disease. On the other hand, secondary Raynaud's phenomena has an underlying cause. It often occurs because of conditions like it occurs due to connective tissue disorders. Especially, there is a condition known as scleroderma. Also, scleroderma also called as systemic sclerosis. It can also occur due to drugs. What are the three common drugs which have been implicated? You have beta blockers like propranolol. It can occur due to anti-neoplastic uh, agents like cisplatin. It can also occur due to bleomycin. As opposed to the primary form, it is less common but more severe. There is uh, Many patients are found to have a positive anti-nuclear antibody. Family history may or may not be present. It is generally more severe form and some patients can progress some patients can progress to ulcers or gangrene formation. So ulcer and gangrene formation occurs typically in the secondary form. So if they put a case where they say episodic pallor happens, cyanosis happens, hyperemia or recovery happens and there is no ulcer gangrene and it is mild self-limited, no underlying uh, abnormality detected, likely to be primary Raynaud phenomena. So if you are having Raynaud phenomena right now, don't worry, it is a normal phenomena. Can happen in certain individuals due to changes in the vasomotor tone. On the other hand, secondary phenomena usually indicates a more severe form and this is the one that we will be focusing on. So obviously the question arises, how will you distinguish between them and say there is a uh, investigation you can do called as nail fold capillaroscopy. Nail fold capillaroscopy is a non-invasive test to distinguish between primary versus secondary Raynaud's phenomena. It also helps in the early diagnosis of systemic sclerosis that is scleroderma because secondary Raynaud is the presenting manifestation in many patients. So what do we do in this case? We perform this procedure at the nail bed. Now how do we do this? This is something not likely to be asked in the FMG exam. But in nail bed, what do we do in the nail bed? We perform capillaroscopy and see how the capillary loops are present. In normal people, see the capillary loops are regular in nature, they are parallel to each other and they are dense. In patients who are having Raynaud's phenomena, this beef image has Raynaud's phenomena uh, due to secondary Raynaud's phenomena. This is secondary, this is primary or normal people. So primary Raynaud and normal people will have these kind of capillary loops. Patients with secondary Raynaud's phenomena will have dilatation of the capillary loop. There will be missing capillary loops here, they call them dropout areas and rarely some patients, there may also be presence of micro hemorrhages. So micro hemorrhages may also be present. So these are the features which are suggestive of secondary phenomena. Have a look at this picture. These two images. Now if these two images are shown in the exam and they ask you, nail fold capillaroscopy is shown, what is your interpretation? In the first image, this is called as primary Raynaud's phenomena. Why? Because the capillary loops are parallel, they are dense and there are no missing capillary loops in between them. Here, can you see there are capillary loops which are missing. They are more tortuous in nature and uh, uh, some, some parts, you can see some early micro hemorrhage also developing in the patient. So this is what you will call as a secondary Raynaud's phenomena. You can get a question on this. Has been asked in FMG? No. Has a question been asked on Raynaud's phenomena? Yes. So please understand this capillaroscopy. It's a bedside investigation and it is now available in many medical colleges. So please can be asked to you as a fresh question in the exam. 
so let us have a look at the question again now so uh, this was the question where the patient had presented with the Raynaud's phenomena and it had progressed to digital gangrene so what are the two clues here this is Raynaud's phenomena because the progression has happened on exposure to cold there is a past history and there is digital gangrene which has happened in the patient as you can see and the patient is also positive for ANA so this is not likely to be Raynaud's disease or primary Raynaud's phenomena it is likely to be secondary Raynaud's phenomena here so kabhi kabhi option B wo likhenge Raynaud's disease sometimes they will write primary Raynaud's phenomena that is why I have interchangeably used them that does not uh, impact the answer in any case this is secondary Raynaud's phenomena which is likely most likely commonly seen due to systemic sclerosis also called as scleroderma with this in mind let us start with the case scenarios we will be doing a lot of case scenarios in this session uh, the, it is going to be extremely high yielding this entire session you are going to find a lot of information uh, integrated with pathology here so look at the first case scenario mcq examiner will say there is a adult female who is having symmetrical leather like skin thickening so this skin thickening leather like skin thickening is a very important clue here second thing they will say that there is skin induration and contractures happening in the hand so skin is becoming thickened and contractures are forming then there is will, a question will say either dysphagia is present or Raynaud's phenomena is present and there will be history of likely lung fibrosis or interstitial lung disease so restrictive lung disease like manifestation will be there sometimes they can put photograph of a contracture hand dysphagia and a flow volume curve which i discussed in part 4 uh, youtube video so there will be flow volume curve showing restrictive lung disease lung fibrosis like condition so what is the likely diagnosis so the clues here are skin thickening dysphagia Raynaud's phenomena interstitial lung disease everything pointing towards scleroderma scleroderma also called as systemic sclerosis it uh, cutaneous involvement is present in all, uh, all, almost all patients so the word ssc systemic sclerosis with cutaneous manifestation is also used for them so these three terms jo hai, scleroderma ssc systemic sclerosis are interchangeably used so uh, what are the two broadly types of uh, scleroderma or systemic sclerosis we have two broad varieties we have the diffuse cutaneous form look at the first form which is involving the entire body that is called as diffuse form and second is called as limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis limited one is usually involving the part distal to the elbows and distal to the knees it can involve dysphagia so head and neck involvement will also be present interstitial lung disease will be relatively rare in these patients that does not mean that limited cutaneous sclerosis is a very mild condition in fact many of them can have life-threatening manifestations also but based upon presentation these are the two broad varieties now what is crest syndrome crest syndrome is often mentioned as a part of uh, scleroderma discussion crest syndrome refers to the manifestation the five classic manifestations happening in the limited scleroderma limited scleroderma means the localized form so what does crest syndrome stand for c stands for calcinosis cutis so a type of dystrophic calcification will happen in the skin secondly there will be Raynaud's phenomena we have already discussed that scleroderma can have a secondary Raynaud's phenomena thirdly esophageal dysmotility can happen which can produce dysphagia to the solids there can be sclerodactyly which can cause fibrosis and scars in the fingers and T stands for telangiectasias that is dilated blood vessels can happen in the skin now uh, how to distinguish between limited uh, systemic sclerosis that is crest syndrome and diffuse systemic sclerosis how would you distinguish between them differences can be asked case scenario based differences can be asked as a one-liner they can be asked in a way all of the following are true about diffuse except all of the following are true about limited uh, ssc except so the table i'm going to take up it incorporates points from the pathology part as well as from the medicine part and the table given in harrison so all at one place you are getting so first of all calcinosis cutis can happen in both but where it is more common i told you crest syndrome ka part hai limited ssc it is more common secondly skin thickening it is distal and slow skin thickening in limited whereas it is diffuse involves the entire body and it is rapidly progressive in cases of diffuse illness then we have Raynaud's phenomena Raynaud's phenomena can occur in both but Raynaud's phenomena is the initial manifestation of limited scler uh, scleroderma limited 
SSC. So precedes skin involvement. In fact, Raynaud's phenomena is the presenting feature in many of these patients. I told you the nail capillaroscopy, how it helps. So limited SSC ko aap identify kar sakte by the knee and fold capillaroscopy. So it precedes the skin involvement. In diffuse SSC, it overlaps with the skin involvement. Then we have the musculoskeletal involvement. Mild joint uh, pain is seen in limited crest syndrome, whereas diffuse scleroderma will have severe arthralgia. Then interstitial lung disease or lung fibrosis, I told you it is mild or absent or it is, you know, you know, not clinically significant in crest syndrome that is limited scleroderma. Diffuse variety, it is present and it is severe. Then pulmonary artery hypertension can be present in either of the two and it is a major reason for morbidity and mortality in the patient. Then scleroderma renal crisis. What will happen is sometimes scleroderma can involve the kidneys. Kidneys will be shrunk. There will be a fall in the GFR. So azotemia can happen. Along with that, inappropriate renin-angiotensin axis can be precipitated and they can present with hypertensive emergencies also. Right, so hypertension with falling GFR and shrunk kidneys bilaterally is called a scleroderma renal crisis. I'm not going into detail because exams are very close and fine points you have already read in your notes. Here I'm only summarizing. So scleroderma, I will repeat, kidneys are shrunken, GFR is low, and hypertensive crisis can happen. I, as I told you, Crest syndrome may be rare to absent, hai, but in diffuse systemic sclerosis, it can occur in up to 15% of the individuals. Then we have autoantibody. Autoantibody, very important. If you look at the past papers, there have been indirect MCQs or in FMG in the pathology part related to which antibody is seen where. Limited form, that is Crest syndrome, will have anti-centromere antibody, whereas the diffuse form will have anti-topoisomerase 1, also called as SCL70, as well as anti-RNA polymerase 3 autoantibody. Yaad karna badega, there is no logic here. And then, MCQ statement. If scleroderma patient has ILD, what sensitive investigation will tell that ILD is developing? In the spirometry, obviously you will be doing the spirometry, but DLCO false, diffusion capacity of lung for carbon monoxide, is usually a early indicator of interstitial lung disease developing in the patient, right? So remember this MCQ based statement. It has not been asked in FMG, but this statement has been asked in other competitive exams. So it can be repeated in some way in your FMG exam as well. Moving further, MCQ funda. Now there is a patient who's having dysphagia. Now dysphagia can occur in scleroderma, dysphagia can occur in achalasia cardia. During workup, how will you distinguish between them? Uh, details of achalasia cardia I have discussed in part 1 rapid revision video. So look at the lower esophageal tone, th that is the lower esophageal sphincter tone on manometry. In case of achalasia cardia, there will be high tone. Remember what was achalasia cardia? Peristalsis comes, but the sphincter does not relax. So there will be high tone. On the other hand, due to fibrosis happening in the sphincter, there will be low esophageal sphincter tone and so scleroderma will have low LES tone. So tone abnormality on manometry will give you the clue that whether the dysphagia is due to scleroderma or due to achalasia cardia. Obviously you will be doing other investigations also. Now scenario number two. Scenario number two says that there is a middle aged female who is having dental caries. So dental caries is happening in her. Second clue they will say dry mouth and the patient is having dysphagia to dry solids. They are having dry eyes. Sometimes they will not say dry eyes. They will say sandy or gritty sensation is present under the eyelids, which along with some inflammation is called as keratoconjunctivitis sicca. And then question we say either ANA is positive or some antibody like anti rho or anti-LA is positive. If two or three of these points are mentioned, the likely diagnosis is going to be Jogren syndrome. Jogren syndrome and scleroderma ek jaise dekhte hain, but they are totally separate. Scleroderma, sclerosis happening in the dermis, that is skin ka thickening ho hai. Jogren syndrome, everything becoming dry, that is called as Jogren syndrome, right? Jogging karenge zada, uh, heat loss hoga, water ka loss hoga, sab kuch dry ho jayega. Stupid way, I know, but works, right? So Jogren syndrome. Now, some additional points about Jogren syndrome you need to know. First of all, Jogren syndrome has the highest risk of lymphomas among all autoimmune diseases. This is a INICT kind MCQ. Similar question has been asked in INICT. FMG may nahi pusha gaya, but one liner is a one liner. Second point is, which as, as HLA is associated with Jogren syndrome, HLA DR3 positivity is seen in these patients. Thirdly, leukopenia and lymphopenia can be seen when you do peripheral uh, blood smear. 
and two antibodies are often positive along with ANA which is non-specific here. So we have SSA and SSB. SSA is called as anti-rho. Now we know there are two types of anti-rho, rho 52 and rho 60. Either of the two or both of the two can be present and anti-la antibodies have also been found to be present. In fact, rho 52, rho 60 is a common uh, antigen sometimes against which antibodies are formed and together they are called as SSA antibody. And then salivary gland biopsy is useful in these patients. Uh, treatment is conservative in mild cases, severe cases. You may sometimes require immunosuppression, but you need to give artificial tears. You need to do uh, lifestyle changes. And uh, many of these patients, you need to watch for the development of lymphomas also. So those points I'm not writing because it's a focused rapid revision session. And for the, uh, sometimes there will be a gritty sensation, but no frank dry eyes. So you can always do a test known as Schirmer's test. This is something you have read in ophthalmology, so I'm not repeating it here. Schirmer's test can be done in which autoimmune disease? Jogren syndrome, it can be done because Schirmer's test tests for lacrimation and lacrimation is reduced, producing dry eyes in Jogren syndrome. Moving to scenario number three. Now, scenario number three says that there is a patient who has difficulty in standing up from squatting position. The patient also has difficulty in combing hair. Before I go further, difficulty in standing up from squatting position means hip girdle muscles are weak. So proximal weakness of the hip uh, girdle. That is lower proximal muscle weakness is there. Difficulty in combing hair means sometimes they will not say difficulty in combing hair. Sometimes they will say difficulty in raising hand above the head. So as a baloko, if you are unable to do this requires your arm to be lifted. It indicates shoulder muscle involvement. So both of them are indicating proximal muscle weakness. Remember this funda that both of them are basically in, uh, indicating there is involvement of proximal muscle in the patient. So proximal muscle involvement or proximal muscle weakness is happening in the patient, right? Move further, positive gover sign you know what is a gover sign there is difficulty in getting up from lying down to standing position originally described in dmd muscular dystrophy now we know it can happen in any proximal muscle dystrophy and they will say very important point there is a similar case scenario already asked in fmg exam in the past violaceous heliotropic rash will occur around the upper eyelids so if you have proximal weakness along with skin involvement so muscle involvement and rash skin involvement the likely diagnosis is dermatomyositis dermato means dermatological involvement myositis means inflammation of the muscle consi muscle proximal muscles are maximally affected right itis ka matlab always indicates inflammation pro ek group hota hai uh, polymyositis dermatomyositis but these are separate condition dermatomyositis is relatively more common and very frequently asked in the entrance exam now dermatomyositis there are some uh, photographs that you need to know what are the key features that are seen in the cutaneous manifestations of dermatomyositis. They can be asked as a spotter, they can be asked as an image, they can be asked as a part of a case scenario. So this is the heliotropic rash. So on the upper eyelid, violet colored rash will be there. Many times it will be associated with lid edema also. So edema may or may not be present, but this upper eyelid will be having a rash in the patient. Secondly, there is a V sign. What is V sign? Photosensitive red colored rash happening in the chest and neck region. So, usko kehte hai, V sign. Then many patients will have, particularly young children and adults with dermatomyositis. Dermatomyositis can occur at any age. If it occurs in children, it is called as juvenile dermatomyositis. If it occurs in adults, we simply call it as dermatomyositis. So, many of these patients on the metacarpophalangeal joint, the dorsum and the interphalangeal joints, you will have some papules present. These papules will be white, keratotic, and they will be having central atrophy and surrounding there will be scales. And if you remove the scales, you may find some erythema to be present also. These are what you call as gotron papule. So gotron papule kya hote hai? Here and here, you will have crusty papules, palpable lesions. Ye red ho sakte hai, ya white ho sakte hai. They will have crust and they will be happening in the typical location as you can see in the picture. Can you see these uh, lesions which are happening here? These lesions are called as the cotron papules. The fourth lesion that you can sometimes see is a sign called as shawl sign. Shawl sign is nothing but a V sign happening at the back. So if you see, so in the shoulder and the back region, upper back, you will see erythema. It is a photosensitive rash again. And finally, you will have this 
condition. In the nail beds of the patient, you will have bleeding happening or dilated vessels. We call them as nail bed telangiectasias. So these are the five cutaneous manifestations, five cutaneous signs seen in a patient of dermatomyositis. If you have seen the picture twice, you will not go wrong in the exam. So remember them. So let us do some additional points related to dermatomyositis, uh, more common in females compared to males and can occur at any age. Proximal muscle weakness is seen and a raised creatine kinase because muscle is inflamed, so muscle ke andar ka enzyme will be elevated. And antibodies positivity are seen. Three, uh, four types of antibody positivity have been shown, but none of them is, you know, uh, a screening test. They are useful in uh, doubtful cases. So they are anti-MDF5, anti-TIF1, anti-MI2 and anti-NXP2. Then muscle biopsy will show the hallmark finding of perifascicular atrophy. There is a neat PG question asked on this. So muscle biopsy shows perifascicular atrophy and there is a higher risk of developing interstitial lung disease as well as malignancy in dermatomyositis. Now scenario number four. Before I show you the case scenario, they will show you an image. What this image is showing? It is likely a girl who's having photosensitive butterfly distribution of rash occurring on the nose, nasal bridge as well as going to the cheek. But the nasolabial folds are spared. So we know where it is going. Yes, you thought it right. This rash is often seen in SLE patient. But let's see the case. So examiner will say that there is a middle-aged female. Autoimmune disease more common in female than males, middle-aged most commonly. So middle-aged female, butterfly distribution of photosensitive erythematous red colored rash on the nose and cheek and spares the nasolabial fold. Nasolabial fold, this line, this is called the nasolabial folds, right? And these patients, they may have joint pain, they may have hematological manifestations like anemia or thrombocytopenia and ANA is a screening test for them. So ANA positive patient will be there. I hope you know that ANA positivity ke bina, you cannot make the diagnosis of SLE. ANA positivity has to be there. More of on it, we will come in some time. So if you get a case like this or a photograph like this or some information like this, likely diagnosis in the patient is going to be systemic lupus erythematosus. It's an autoimmune condition, fairly common in this uh, community. Lupus means like a wolf. Like a wolf, it destroys the internal organs. It eats up the body from inside. And it is a multi-organ, multi-systemic disorder and very frequently asked in all exams. Still, you will keep giving entrance exam. SLE will always be there being asked. So I will spend slightly more time discussing key aspects of SLE. SLE is a huge topic. I can go on discussing it for three or four hours. But here, I know time is a constraint. So I will just summarize in the next 10 minutes what all important things from a, uh, entrance perspective you need to know, from exam perspective you need to know about SLE. So let us start. So first of all, autoantibodies in SLE, four times they have been asked in the exam. I will not show any table. I will just mention what I have written already so that I can explain. So first is ANA. ANA stands for anti-nuclear antibody. It is the most important antibody in SLE. FMG 2019 had a question. Which is the most important antibody without which diagnosis of SLE cannot be made? The answer was ANA, anti-nuclear antibody. It is useful as a screening test. It has a good sensitivity, but it is not specific. It can occur in other conditions also. I just told you it can occur in scleroderma patients. It can sometimes occur in Jogren syndrome patients also. Second is anti-double-stranded DNA, anti-DS DNA is highly specific. So if they ask you most specific consai, most sensitive consai, ANA. Most specific is anti-double-stranded DNA and it also correlates with disease activity. If high titers, active disease. Low titers or falling titer, patients' inflammation getting controlled in SLE. Right? Third, anti-Smith antigen is also a very specific antibody, but there is always a confusion which is more specific. Double stranded DNA is more specific. Agar that is not in the option, the next best answer will be anti Smith antigen antibody. Then we have anti histone antibody, old MCQ, seen in drug induced SLE. Drugs can also produce systemic lupus erythematosus. They will not have other manifestation. They will have anti histone antibody to be present. Then anti C1Q is a very interesting antibody. It has been uh, increasing role has been proposed. 63% patients can have lupus nephritis. See, lupus nephritis SLE. Hai. It's a renal manifestation. So renal SLE will always have ANA. So ANA to hoga. But which is specific for renal involvement? The answer will be anti-C1Q antibody. Okay. Then anti-phospholipid antibody is against either cardiolipin antigen or against beta-2 glycolipid. Anti-phospholipid antibody also produces a syndrome called as APLA syndrome. And these are the patients. 
if there is a female child bearing age and she has anti phospholipid antibody positive uh, th there is a high risk of spontaneous abortions in the lady so bad obstetric history you should rule out apla antibody in the serum and then you have non specific anti antibodies like anti rnp anti ro and anti la these are non specific they can occur in other conditions also rnp antibody sometimes it can be associated with cns manifestations as well right now what is the ular acr diagnostic criteria this criteria says that the entry criteria says ana has to be positive or kitna titer equal to or more than 1 ratio 80 on hep 2 cells or any equivalent positive test so anti nuclear antibody high titer should be there agar absent to asli nahi hai if it is positive then we will look at the other criteria now in the other criteria there should be at least one clinical criteria along with the other lab criteria and the total number should be equal to or more than 10 points and these feature need not occur simultaneously they can come one after the other right so what are the criteria have a look at the criteria this is the criteria so we have the clinical domain and we have the immune domain in the clinical domain we have fever this is a table that we clinically use so fever mein we give a score of 2 weight is nothing but score then we have hematological criteria we have neuropsychiatric features we have mucocutaneous features which includes your rash it includes serosal involvement that is pleural pericardial involvement and pericarditis musculoskeletal that is joint involvement renal involvement and they have based upon how what degree of involvement is there you will give a score and then you will also look at the immune criteria and then give scores accordingly remember if only immune criteria is if no an is there sle cannot be diagnosed if only immune criteria is there sle cannot be diagnosed at least one domain should be there and when you take the total score the total score should be 10 or more then you make the diagnosis of sle right unlikely they are going to put up this table and ask you to make a table in the exam but understanding the table is important so table i have given it to you give a, a good reading to this table at least twice so that if a mcq option is asked you can identify in the paper now what are the key rapid fire one liners we need to remember first thing what is the most common presentation of sle it is joint involvement and what is the type of joint involvement intermittent polyarthritis remember there is a uh, migratory polyarthritis which is seen in rheumatic fever intermittent non deforming polyarthritis is seen in sle when i say non deforming erosions are not seen in more than 90% cases or agar erosion ho bhi a deformity ho bhi it corrects by itself once the inflammation is controlled so classically sle is called as a non deforming non erosive arthritis past mcq point right and this is also a past mcq point moving further what is the acute skin manifestation malar rash i told you malar rash the depiction the photograph i showed you then most serious or life threatening involvement renal involvement or lupus nephritis kidney involvement and what is the six classes of lupus nephritis there are six classes which are described so renal biopsy is mandatory so we have class 1 to class 6 class 1 is minimal mesangial lln class 2 may mesangial proliferates class 3 and 4 have focal and diffuse uh, uh lupus nephritis focal will involve less than 50% in class 3 class 4 will have diffuse both class 3 and class 4 will present with hematuria and proteinuria so they will have rbcs also present and they will have protein also present so proteinuria along with hematuria in urine will be present in class 3 and class 4 and if someone asks you which is the most severe with which the patient presents life threatening kaun si hai crescentic glomerulonephritis kis mein common hai which is the one which is uh, uh, which has the highest aggressive course the answer will be class 4 class 4 is considered to be a very uh, aggressive form class 5 membranous lupus nephritis it resembles membranous glomerulopathy in patients ke andar rbcs are rare so they present with nephrotic syndrome so if they ask you which left variety presents with nephrotic syndrome where only proteinuria is present massive proteinuria is present that is class 5 and class 6 advanced sclerosing uh, it is also this is the one which is going to progress to end stage renal disease mm -hmm. or chronic kidney disease can happen in these patients and they will often require renal transplant after the primary inflammation has been controlled so these are the six classes acute illness acute mortality maximum seen in class 4 class 6 it's like a burnt out disease fibrosis necrosis sclerosis uh, collapse of most glomeruli has happened now 
some more points mcq 2019 one liner most common pulmonary manifestation is pleurite disinflammation of the pleura it may or may not be associated with pleural effusion that is fluid collection rare type of endocarditis rare hai but agar naam puche ki kis mein dikhta hai to lebman sachs endocarditis is described only in patients with sle lebman sachs endocarditis it is not diagnostic it is just present then most common hematological abnormality in sle is normocytic normochromic anemia due, due to the inflammation then coombs positive autoimmune hemolytic anemia aiha can also happen drug induced sle is seen due to which condition mcq point you will find this question in pharma also in medicine also so the mnemonic for this is ship but there are two p's here S stands for sulfonamide, H stands for hydralazine, I stands for isoniazide, P stands for procainamide, and last P stands for phenytoin. So five common causes. Sub me nahi, but with certain genetic predisposition or family history or antihistone antibody positivity, if you give these drugs, they can precipitate SLE-like illness. Then most common CNS manifestation is cognitive dysfunction. If I say in simple language, in a local language, Hindi language, दिमाग हिल जाता है. Not a polite way to say, but ऐसे याद कर लो दिमाग हिल जाता है हिल जाने का मतलब uh, when I say the person, uh, the patient, is, I literally mean cognitive dysfunction is happening. Cognitive dysfunction means patient will become unreasonable. He will, he or she will start throwing tantrum. He or she will start forgetting the things. He or she will have mood outbursts, and he or she will start doing bizarre behaviors. That is the most common manifestation. Second most common manifestation is headaches, but uh they cannot be put into any specific category they may be having a migraine like pattern more commonly they have a non migraineous uh, intermittent severe headaches then neonatal sle if there is a newborn with sle to kaun si antibody positive hogi look for anti rho antibody positivity 90% of them according to harrison as well as nelson they are positive for anti rho so 10% are found to be positive for anti la also and uh, most common cardiac manifestation of sle is pericarditis which may or may not be associated with effusion and then case mcq a pregnant lady comes with severe uncontrolled sle and she delivers a baby what cardiac problem the baby is likely to have the baby is likely to have congenital complete heart block congenital complete heart block and why because that would have caused damage to the av node in the patient right Let's move further. Now let us have a look at scenario number five. Scenario number five question will say it is a middle-aged adult can occur in both male and female, but as we shall see, disease is more severe in case of males. So middle-aged adult patient is having recurrent oral ulcers. These ulcers look like aphthous ulcer. They have a, a erythematous margin. They have a necrotic base. and they are painful in nature so the recurrent painful oral ulcers will be there we know that whenever mouth ulcers happen they are painful right so recurrent episodes will happen there will be recurrent painful genital ulcers also in males they will occur on the penis in case of females it will occur on the vulva so recurrent painful genital ulcers thirdly another thing examiner may might say that there is a pathology test which was found to be positive what is pathology test i will tell you Uh, after the diagnosis is over so pathology test is positive and another clue examiner will say either there is a cutaneous lesion called as erythema nodosum often seen on the limbs particularly in the tibial aspects or there will be inflammation in the uveal tract called as uveitis anterior uveitis can happen posterior uveitis can happen or pan uveitis can happen right so oral ulcer genital ulcer pathology test positive skin involvement and uh, eye involvement in the form of uveitis if you have a picture like this the likely diagnosis in the patient is going to be bichet disease also called as bichet syndrome right uh, remember that bichet syndrome for it to be diagnosed the oral ulcers have to be present so recurrent oral ulcers are always present in the patient you cannot make the diagnosis there can be atypical forms of bichet disease where oral ulcers may not be the presenting feature but in general most bichet syndrome patients you will have oral ulcers always present sometime during the history of the illness now what are the additional points about bichet disease you should know first thing it is associated with hla hla b5 and hla b51 it's a past mcq point noted down second point although 
एंटी सेकेरोमाइसिस सर्वेशिय एंटीबॉडी ए एस्का मे बी पॉजिटिव इन सम बेश डिजीज इज नॉट कॉस्ड बाय ऑटो एंटीबॉडीज एंड दिस इज अ एफ एम जी एमसीक्यू क्वेश्चन आस्ट इन एफ एम जी एमसीक्यू फोर ईयर्स बैक वॉज विच अमंग द फॉलोइंग इन ऑटो इम्यून ऑब्लिक ऑटो इन्फ्लेमेटरी डिजीज द पैथोजेनेसिस इज नॉट मीडिएटेड बाय एंटीबॉडीज द आंसर इज बेश डिजीज Why Bichat disease happened? There are many theories, and it's a very complex etiology. In fact, there is a school of thought which says that Bichat disease co you cannot put in one category. It is at the overlap junction of auto in uh, auto immune and auto inflammatory disorder, but does not have characteristics of the either. Right? Then Bichat disease, what is the treatment that you are going to do? If it is oral or genital ulcer, both of them respond to. topical steroids followed by oral corticosteroids and uh, these days steroid sparing agent called as epramilast is available is epramilast available in india yes it is available in india slightly costly but a very effective safe agent in fact epramilast has been indicated if someone asks you are the apart from bisha disease epramilast is now considered a good therapy first line therapy in which condition one of the answer will be सिवियर रिफ्रैक्टरी सोराइसिस इन देशेंट तो याद कर लो रिमेंबर दिस दैट एप्रेमिलाइज इज इंडिकेटेड इन बेशर डिजीज ऑल्सो एंड डर्मेटोलॉजिकल डिसऑर्डर सोराइसिस उसका बेशर से लेना देना नहीं है इट इज नॉट रिलेटेड टू इट बट एप्रेमिलाइज कैन बी यूज इन सोराइसिस ऑल्सो रिमेंबर दिस की पॉइंट राइट एंड if the patient develops uveitis uh, there is a risk of blindness happening if it is a pan uveitis and so you need to give systemic immunosuppressants among them harrison says azathioprine is the most effective or the preferred agent right now i told you about pathology test pathology test kaise karte hain first of all it is usually done in the forearm so remember it is usually done in the forearm so i'm writing on the side it is usually done in the forearm so forearm mein hum kya karte hain we take a 20 gauze needle and then we either do a simple pin prick sometimes bichat disease particularly young patient it is not uh, possible to do it with pin prick alone to hum kya karenge intradermally at 30 to 45 degree angle you will insert that needle into the skin and inject just 0.1 ml of saline into it after 48 hours you will see that patients of bichat disease there will be a erythematous papule or pustule forming if it is a pustule it will be a sterile pustule sterile ka matlab no bacteria will be cultured from that right so erythematous papule or pustule size more than 2 mm will be seen at the site after 48 hour this is considered to be a positive pathology test and this positive pathology test is indicative of bichat disease let's move further look at scenario number 6 question will say examiner will say there is a middle aged adult the adult is having painful inflammation of small joints of hands and feet particularly involving the metacarpophalangeal joint and proximal interphalangeal joint these joints are uh, painfully involved so this is a very important clue and then joint stiffness is there in these joints it it is more in the morning and lasts more than one hour and the stiffness improves with physical activity if you have a case scenario like this the likely diagnosis in the patient is going to be rheumatoid arthritis a case scenario on this has been asked in the old neat pg exam it has not been asked similar to this in uh, fmg exam but rheumatoid arthritis you all know it has been asked in the exams in the past in fmg papers and just a matter of time before a case scenario is asked on this so clues will be uh, joint stiffness hai which joints are getting involved mcp and pip and they are painfully inflamed and with physical activity this exertion tends to improve right the remaining joints of the body are less commonly involved now rheumatoid arthritis associated with which hla hla drb1 is found to be associated in about 65 to 70% of these patients rheumatoid arthritis what are the additional points you would know first of all extra articular outside joint involvement manifestations are seen in up to 40% of these patients and the most common extra articular feature hota hai nodule formation that is rheumatoid nodule which among the following is true regarding rheumatoid nodules and rheumatoid arthritis is an mcq asked 3 years back in fmg exam तो नोड्यूल्स कैसे होते हैं पुट आई एम पुटिंग अ क्यू हियर नोड्यूल्स आर सबकुटेनियस दे आर फर्म दे आर नॉन टेंडर पेनफुल नहीं होते हैं पेनफुल नोड्यूल्स अकरिंग इन पल्प ऑफ फिंगर इज सीन इन इन्फेक्टिव एंडोकार्डाइटिस ऑस्लर नोड होते हैं याद कर लो दिस इज सीन एट दी एक्सटेंसर सर्फेसिस ऑफ द बॉडी एंड दे आर नॉन टेंडर दे को रिलेट विद रूमेटॉइड फैक्टर पॉजिटिविटी एंड डिजीज सिविरिटी सो आर एफ पॉजिटिव पेशेंट्स के अंदर नोड्यूल्स आर ऑफन फाउंड देन 
if they ask what is the most common lung manifestation of ra it is pleuritis and uh, if uh, there is a patient who is having ild with fibrosis you will have fall in dlco and these patients have a poor prognosis again it's a fmg mcq 2018 the question was which among the following is a indicator of pulmonary involvement in a rheumatoid arthritis patient one of the option was fall in dlco diffusion capacity of lung for carbon monoxide and that was the answer now the deformities in rheumatoid arthritis multiple types of deformities are seen i'm not going into the rare deformities three deformities you need to remember the first deformity is called as mallet finger in mallet finger there is isolated flexion happening at the distal interphalangeal joint so this is the distal interphalangeal joint and you have flexion happening that is called as mallet finger it is like this and it has turned inwards like this this is called as mallet finger then we have the botonier deformity what is botonier deformity the proximal interphalangeal joint is showing flexion and the distal interphalangeal joint is showing extension here so this is called as botonier deformity and then we have the swan neck deformity in swan neck deformity reverse will happen the proximal interphalangeal joint will show hyperextension that is extension and flexion will happen at the distal interphalangeal joint right so that the reverse of botonier deformity is called as swan neck deformity so look at the images they can show you the image they can ask you what is incorrect or they can give you a depiction a patient with rheumatoid arthritis is having this much flexion at this joint and extension at this joint what is the likely deformity patient might have this is two or three ways examiner can ask in the exam moving further there are some key points i have accumulated from multiple sources at one place so first thing to remember is atlanto axial subluxation is common in down, in rheumatoid arthritis patients in 10% cases and they can cause cervical spine injury very commonly so patients who are rheumatoid arthritis we advise them that uh, they should always be wearing seat belt they should be avoiding doing all these uh, yogas and uh, pilates exercises which are very popular these days so breathing exercises are fine but anything which involves exertion or stress in the neck region should be avoided in rheumatoid arthritis patient because injury can happen said can is most common hematological abnormality it is normocytic normochromic anemia what is felty syndrome felty syndrome it's a mcq one liner which has been asked three things if they are present we say felty syndrome seen in rarely patient will have neutropenia patient will have splenomegaly and patient will have rheumatoid arthritis with nodules so we call it as nodular ra then what is the common leukemia seen in ra there is a specific leukemia called as t cell large granular lymphocyte leukemia also called as tlgl patients of rheumatoid arthritis also develop lymphoma sometimes the lymphoma seen in ra is diffuse large b cell lymphoma most common cause of death in ra is cardiovascular disease accelerated atherosclerosis can happen which can lead to myocardial infarction in the patient and we have two types of antibodies available rheumatoid factor and anti ccp rheumatoid factor antibodies are igm but there are chances of false positive antibody formation also and so the more sensitive and slightly more specific for uh, rheumatoid arthritis is anti ccp antibody so agar puche ki which one is to be done which is has a higher predictive value of ra it is anti ccp antibody ccp stands for cyclic uh, citrullinated peptide antibodies right details the uh, of these antibodies percentages they are mentioned in the textbooks if you have time you can read them if you don't have time you can leave them but remember anti ccp antibodies are the preferred test in rheumatoid arthritis management of rheumatoid arthritis uh, the rheumatic agents the disease modifying agents etc this is something you have already read in pharmacology now uh, scenario number 7 question will say examiner will say there is a patient having old age or obesity so old age and obesity are the risk factors pain in happening in both the knee joints so knee joints are commonly involved large joints and clicking or crackling sound is heard during walking likely diagnosis osteoarthritis so yaad kar lo three o's are seen in the three o's you need to remember old age obesity osteoarthritis right old age obesity osteoarthritis pain in the joints and clicking sound crackling sound heard during walking if you find presence of fever if you find presence of severe joint inflammation or any association with severe extra articular manifestation you should think twice it is unlikely to be osteoarthritis it can happen in rare forms but osteoarthritis generally has 
it's progressive joint erosion with age it's like a natural process which is exaggerated in certain risk factors about osteoarthritis uh, additional points overall it is the most common cause or most common type of arthritis worldwide and uh, it usually spares three joints wrist elbow and ankle are spared according to harrison 20 uh, first edition and gdf5 gene polymorphisms have a higher risk of developing osteoarthritis ye naya cheez hai so earlier we used to think that osteoarthritis is only a uh, old age related illness but now we know that gdf5 gene polymorphisms comprise early and severe onset osteoarthritis ye naya cheez hai jo add hua hai and this has a potential of being asked in the exam moving to scenario number 8 we a uh, question will say adult with painful inflammation of the first metatarsophalangeal joint of the great toe which is called as podagra severely inflamed first toe ka mtp joint secondly tarsal and ankle and knee joints can sometimes be involved and the pain is more at night it is severe it can mimic cellulitis the entire joint area will be inflamed swollen and patient will have difficulty in even wearing socks or wearing shoes or chappals so slippers also patient cannot wear be so inflamed and even at night if the patient is you know taking the uh, quilt and the quilt just touches upon that it will cause severe pain in the patient and he will weaken him up from the from the sleep that kind of severe pain will be seen so examiner will also put a scenario the large joint large toe mtp joint is intensely inflamed and patient gets up crying with pain at night this is how the patient presents and episodes are triggered by food particularly purine rich foods like meats and non vegetarian foods alcohol trauma sometimes diuretics can also precipitate it right so the likely diagnosis in the patient is gout gout is the likely diagnosis here regarding gout some additional points gout occurs because of the urate uh, uh, excess deposition in the inflammation in the in the joint space synovial space causing inflammation so acute gout what is the investigation you would do fmg 2018 mcq synovial fluid uric acid level because at many times the serum uric acid levels may not be elevated and the correlation between acute gout and serum uric acid levels is less sensitive so it will always do synovial fluid uric acid level so aspiration may sometimes be needed then avoid aspirin in case acute gout patient comes to you aspirin can cause further crystallization and uh, deposition and it can paradoxically sometimes worsen the inflammation so kya use karna hai indomethacin ibuprofen can be used but indomethacin despite its gi side effects it is very effective and it has potent anti inflammatory action it here for chronic gout you have two categories under excretor and over producer if it is under excretor of uric acid you will use agent known as proben acid if it is over producer you will use either allopurinol or febuxostat remember that allopurinol is contraindicated in renal failure and so if the patient is having renal urate stones or urate stones producing G, uh, low gfr and patient also has gout you will also use febuxostat so question bolega gout ka patient hai he also has a renal manifestation he is over producer of uric acid serum uric acid levels are high which agent to be used agar if renal failure was not mentioned answer would be allopurinol if renal failure is mentioned the answer will be febuxostat right now what is martel sign martel sign looks something like this have a look at this so tophi gouty tophi will collect and they will produce a protrusion and inflammation in the first mtp joint area and it can become massively enlarged and involve the adjacent uh, skin surface also when you do radiology you will find multiple punched out erosions at the first mtp joint this is called as the martel sign how would you distinguish between gout versus pseudo gout there is also a condition known as pseudo gout if you look at past paper one old mcq on pseudo gout has also been asked so gout pseudo gout how, what are the differences let's look at this table gout tends to occur in a patient over 40 pseudo gout tends to occur in old age patients usually above 60 or 70 years sites affected in gout are small joint whereas pseudo gout involves the large joint most commonly the knee joint clinical features gout is more severe pseudo gout can have severe manifestation but mostly these patients have mild to moderate inflammation radiological features gout will have soft tissue swelling but it is not seen until 6 to 12 years after the initial attack in pseudo gout can chondrocalcinosis that is calcification of the articular cartilage menisci is often present and lastly crystal deposition kaun se crystal deposit hote hain which produce inflammation 
यूरिक एसिड और यूरेट क्रिस्टल्स आर डिपोजिटेड इन गाउट वी नो इट सूडो गाउट में कैल्शियम पायरोफॉस्फेट क्रिस्टल्स इट दे आर ऑल्सो रिटर्न एस सीपीपी क्रिस्टल्स आर डिपोजिटेड इन सूडो गाउट सो लार्ज ज्वाइंट एल्डरली कैल्सिफिकेशन ऑफ द कार्टिलेज रिजेंबलिंग गाउट बट नॉट ड्यू टू यूरिक एसिड क्रिस्टल ड्यू टू सीपीपी क्रिस्टल एंड मॉडरेट पेन इन्फ्लेमेशन दैट इज यू डुकआउट सीपीपी क्रिस्टल्स आर डिपॉजिटेड इज अ पास्ट वन लाइनर एफ एम जी एम सी क्यू राइट सो दिस फिनिशेज आर डिस्कशन हियर इट्स अ ब्रीफ वीडियो इट्स अ शॉर्ट वीडियो बिकॉज आई वॉन्ट डोंट वॉन्ट टू मेक अ टू लेंथी वीडियो एंड आई वॉन्ट यू टू रिवाइज ऑल दिस बिफोर आई पुट अप द बिग वीडियो ऑन न्यूरोलॉजी एंड सम के सीनैरियोज रिलेटेड टू नेफ्रोलॉजी ऑल्सो आई हैव एडिट इट हेड so that video also will go up soon within a few hours of this video going live i know i want you to have at least 5 days before your you sit in the fmg exam and for those students who are watching this video after the fmg exam will be over uh, the topics will remain the same and these videos are going to be useful at the same time they are not replacement for existing note they are not replacement for textbook reading and they are not replacement for uh, clinical knowledge right we'll meet soon in the next video don't miss the last video the next video will be the last one rapid revision part 6 i will take up neurology and i will take up at least 10 to 12 different case scenarios thank you very much